Hello and welcome to today's webinar, which will be on cloud computing policies and impacts in Asia and the Pacific. My name is John Byrne, Principal Economist at the Economic Research and, e and Development Impact Department at ADB. Um, the webinar today will draw on recent research that we conducted, which was later published as an ADB Institute policy brief, um, which we will post in, in the chat. And basically, the focus of the work that we carried out looked at the impact of cloud computing on economic growth, some of the challenges faced by economies in Asia and the Pacific in implementing uh, cloud adoption policies, and some of the wider implications for um, these types of policies in relation to, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the structure of the presentation of the webinar today is as follows. We will have a presentation by Raul Katz, who is president of Telecom Advisory Services, New York. Um, after that, we will have a panel discussion, which comprises four panelists. Um, firstly, Peter Morgan, uh, who's senior consulting economist and advisor to the dean uh, at the ADB Institute, will uh, make an intervention. We'll have three other panelists, namely Natasha Bishorner, who's senior manager of a public sector policy at Amazon Web Services for Asia, Pacific, and Japan. Dil Rahut, Vice Chair of Research and Senior Research Fellow at ADB Institute, is also on the panel. Finally, we'll have Mayan, Lee, Mayan Lim, Director of Data Governance at Access Partnership and Emeritus Director of the Asia Cloud Computing Association. Um, so the structure, as I said, um, is quite uh, clear. I will now hand the floor to Raul Katz to make a presentation of the main findings of this research before we turn to the panel discussion. After that, um, we will have a, a short uh, Q&A round. Hopefully, we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for that. Um, so please, I would encourage you to put questions in the chat or the Q&A box wherever possible. And um, we will try to pick those questions up um, towards the end of the of the webinar. So Raul, please uh, go ahead. Well, thank you very much, John. And uh, good morning or good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm actually on the evening side of the world. And if you allow me to um, share my screen with the slides of the presentation. Uh, and as, as John said, um, the objective is to look at economic impact of cloud adoption in Asia Pacific countries. Um, so the, the objective was not only to look at economic impact, but also examining how certain public policies could have an impact on the adoption of cloud and both have an impact on, on, on government's efficiency and the quality of services, but also a derivative effect on the private sector. Um, from that perspective, there are four areas that we focused on. Uh, first, um, look at the current situation. Where is cloud adoption? And, and we took a subset of Asia Pacific countries. We didn't take all of them. And, uh, and look at what were the macro trends and, and public sector adoption. Uh, secondly, um, we assess the economic impact through econometric analysis. So but based on the, the, the um, real data, our empirical strategy was to take a look at how much economic value was being generated by uh, cloud computing. On the third, we looked at the impact of public policies. It, uh, that, that'll mean look at specific policies and how those might um, have an effect on the development on cloud. And finally, look at the economic impact of those uh, policy changes. So if we start with the first um, uh, situation, the first assessment, this is where adoption is in this subset of countries. And what you clearly see, uh, and this is measured as a percent of um, enterprises with more than uh, 10 employees. Uh, the data generally comes from the OECD and or uh, specific uh, statistical agencies uh, within certain countries. And, and what you see in the picture is you, you basically have two levels of development, two speeds of development on cloud. Uh, on, on the one hand, you have Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, and Japan with high level of adoption in enterprises. And then you have a subset of countries where adoption doesn't reach more than 35%. The question is, well, what is occurring here that is driving um, the speed of adoption in certain countries versus a uh, certain slow uh, pace in, in, in other countries? Um, 
in in fact, uh, when you look at cloud spending, which is how much is being spent both by uh, the public and the private sector in cloud, you tend to see similar kind of bimodal distribution. You have some countries where, as a percent of the GDP on, on the right-hand uh, chart, uh, the, the, the spending as a percent of GDP is, is fairly sizable. And then other countries where uh, it is, it's, it's lower in terms of the overall um, spending. So we have bimodal distributions on adoption, bimodal distributions on spending. The third point is we examine the public sector. And, and it's important to say that the public sector is one of the most important users of uh, cloud computing. Um, if you look at the lower chart, the, the one in the middle, what you can see is that in some countries such as Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, the spending by the public sector is higher than 25% of the total cloud spending. So, so clearly, um, uh, you know, government services, um, the, the operations of governments, the monitoring of national security is heavily relied on cloud computing. And, and that makes any sort of policies that you tend to adopt in order to stimulate the adoption of cloud within the public sector to be, to be particularly relevant. Um, why is it and uh, just purely from a, a theoretical standpoint, why is cloud so important economically? Well, essentially what you're talking about, for those that don't know how cloud operates, is, is you, you have uh, extremely large data centers that by, by virtue of their size have enormous economies of scale in the processing of information relative to, let's say, on-premise uh, data centers that are located within companies. Not only there are economies of scale, but there is somewhat of a scalability in the sense that uh, both companies and the public sector buy processing capacity as they go on, as they need it. And therefore, there's a, an ability to actually optimize the usage of, of, of these capital uh, platforms. The third is because of this rapid scalability, you can develop new products very rapidly. And also, you reduce your cost of um, software development because the cloud service providers assume a large responsibility in developing some of the core uh, elements of uh, information technology. All these uh, range of effects produces a, a reduction on information technologies as a cost, uh, as an intermediate input on, 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 on the operations of a company or a government, and at the same time, improved efficiency and quality of services. So if this theoretically works, what is the effect that the econometric analysis indicates? And clearly what you see is that the, the impact is quite important. When you look at the impact on GDP of cloud computing, we divide it in two areas. On one hand, the, the, the spending per se, which has an impact on the GDP, and that's the, the lower um, uh, part of, of this chart, that's purely the purchasing of cloud services by governments and the private sector. But then you have what we call the spillovers, which is all these, how all these effects that I was talking about before um, materialize themselves in the functioning of the economy. If I have more efficient use of capital, uh, in terms of data processing, that would have a spillover effect on productivity, on, on, on the efficiency of enterprises, on the delivery of services. When we look at the impact on GDP, we add those two effects. And as you can see, uh, particularly in those countries that have a high level of cloud adoption, the impact on GDP is quite important. While on an average basis, an increase in penetration of 1% yields an average GDP increase of 0.0%. In some cases, that spillover effect, which is the yellow part of this chart, is quite significant, which is that um, there is um, a way of maximizing the economic impact of cloud by increasing the amount of penetration. To countries that have a larger penetration of cloud will yield more important economic effects. Um, clearly, uh, any economists that would look at this would say, well, there is a, a relationship between the development of an economy and the adoption of cloud. And, and that happens with all information technologies. The higher the size of the economy, when you measure it by GDP per capita, the more important will be the adoption of cloud and therefore uh, 
in potentially the, 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 the economic impact. But if you look at the uh, correlation and the position of each of those countries, you can start uh, telling that there's something else beyond economic development that is driving uh, cloud adoption. And, and that serves as a background to the theory of change that we are trying to prove. But basically, the way this works is that when the government implements certain policies to promote the development and adoption of cloud in the public sector, that has two parallel uh, streams of, of, of impact. On the one hand, obviously, a more efficiency operations of government. But on the second, there is a spillover effect on the private sector, because the private sector sees that governments take positions on cybersecurity, on the uh, risk control of localization of data, on the maximization of an industry structure that facilitates the adoption of cloud computing. All those things have an impact on the private sector, which when combined with the effects on the on the public sector has an overall impact on the GDP. So two sort of strands of, of, of economic effect. So the question that we asked ourselves is, if um, the uh, economic contribution of cloud increases with penetration, which would be the lower um, uh, line, conceptually speaking, in this chart, what could we do from a policy standpoint to accelerate the growth of cloud? to accelerate the, the, the adoption of cloud, both in governments and in uh, the uh, private sector. And we examined a whole set of uh, policies. And uh, after our examination, we um, sort of circled around three elements that were particularly critical in stimulating the, the, the adoption of cloud. In the first um, type of policy is the structure, uh, the industry structure for the delivery of cloud services. Um, and when I say industry structure, if like if you have a competitive market for the delivery of cloud services, there is all, uh, oper the, uh, let's say uh, the public sector and the private sector benefit from these uh, innovation, uh, pricing, uh, new, new facilities, in fact, um, a competitive industry structure, what we call the advanced structure in service provisioning, is going to be more effective than if you were to have cloud services being offered by a single state-owned uh, provider. That provides a high level of distortion of, 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 the, of the market per se. But beyond the structure of the, the industry, the cloud industry, you have other elements such as the data localization principles. And from an advanced standpoint, if there is a risk control approach for data to be stored locally or processed wherever it makes more sense from an economic standpoint, and I underline risk control approach, that'll give you a more efficient way of processing, of profiting from the installations of large data centers across the world. On the other hand, if you are very restrictive in terms of how data is being stored and processed, that uh, hampers the ability of public and private sector to benefit from all the um, uh, abilities, technological innovation that is being supplied by international cloud service providers. And finally, you have uh, the level of cybersecurity. And again, the more advanced when it's measured by the ITU index, uh, International Telecommunication Union, in terms of the legal framework, the cybersecurity uh, organization and processes and methods, again, the more um, uh, advantageous that structure is gonna be for the development of cloud. So these three types of policies are very important to maximize the development of the industry and ultimately its economic impact. We rank the countries across these three policies. And I have to say that the, the ranking uh, in terms of their positioning is not consistent. There are some countries that could be advanced in certain policy levels and intermediate in others. But that being said, there's uh, a set of countries, and those are Australia, Singapore, uh, New Zealand, and Malaysia, that appear to have uh, between an advanced and intermediate level of development on these three policies. So the question is, what were to happen for countries that tend to move within this advanced level of, of, of policy implementation? How do we move the, um, how do we shift 
the vector of growth in the industry by moving to the uh, upside path. For that purpose, um, we, mo we, we modeled some scenarios. Scenarios that are constructed on the basis of the econometric models that I presented to you before, basically looking at international data, understanding on an international basis, what was the effect of those countries that were at the advanced level of development? And then we moved at what were to happen in, in those countries that are the, at the beginning of the presentation, I highlighted as being at a lower level of development. What happens to those that hadn't uh, pursue that higher level of cloud adoption as I showed before? And we uh, uh, presented that in terms of scenarios. Uh, a high scenario is one where um, countries not only uh, uh, develop at a faster pace, but implement those policies that I was uh, mentioning before in terms of those advanced levels. And uh, obviously we focused on those countries that we had seen before that had uh, a lower level of cloud adoption. And as you can see, the effect is quite sizable in terms of a uh, uh, um, billion dollars, but most importantly, in terms of percent of GDP, which is presented in our, our, our uh, briefing material. Generally, what we see in these countries is the impact that they would have from a policy standpoint by stimulating the development of the industry beyond its natural growth would range between 0.4 uh, to 0.8 percent of cumulative GDP over the next five years. So the effect is important. Our takeaway of these uh, lessons is that uh, it is important that countries that are interested in maximizing cloud adoption and maximizing the economic contribution that cloud has upon the uh, measures that I presented before have to work on three things. One, it's not only important to introduce cloud for first policy, which is governments considering cloud as the first option when they are talking about configuring the IT, but also uh, promote the development of the cloud industry upon a more competitive industry structure. As I mentioned before, competition between foreign service providers and domestic service providers is a critical uh, element for maximizing adoption. Secondly, a risk-based approach to government classification. Clearly, there's going to be some data that has to stay within countries, but there's most of the rest of the data should be allowed to be processed outside, stored outside, because even the foreign uh, providers have a very um, optimal way of, of maximizing and guaranteeing security levels. And finally, the enacting of law and regulations on cybercrime and cybersecurity as a way of guaranteeing that the information that is being processed both domestically and outside the country borders is being uh, conducted properly. So those are the three elements we believe policy is important, as we tend to say in, in economics, policy matters. And that's one of the big lessons taken away from our, our analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raul, for a very informative uh, presentation. So clearly, the size of the economy not only matters, but also the policy environment. Um, we're going to have the, the panel session now, which will last for around 20 to 25 minutes, um, whereby each panelist will, will have an intervention, and then we will have the Q&A around after that. So firstly, I would like to um, ask Peter Morgan um, about his view on some of the barriers to cloud computing adoption in, in Asia and the Pacific and how they can be overcome. Uh, Peter, pl please uh, tell us what you think about that. Uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, I think uh, one has to distinguish uh, between adoption of cloud services by the private sector and the public sector. Uh, for the private sector, uh, I think they're both demand and supply side factors. Uh, on the demand side, uh, firms may simply not be aware of the advantages of using cloud computing, uh, or the costs might be too high because of inadequate competition among cloud service providers. Uh, on the supply side, uh, firms may have inadequate access to cloud services due to poor internet connectivity or lack of bandwidth uh, or even unreliable supplies of electricity, especially in rural areas. Uh, and uh, the uh, cloud services might also be inadequate due to lack of competition. So uh, in order to overcome these obstacles, the suggested remedies would include uh, increasing education about the benefits of cloud computing, promoting broadband access in unserved or underserved areas, 
especially high capacity and low latency fixed broadband, uh, ensuring a reliable supply of electricity uh, and promoting greater competition in the cloud services provider uh, sector. Uh, also, as Royal noted, uh, increased government use of the cloud would tend to have positive spillover effects on its use by the private sector. Now, regarding the public sector, uh, as Royal explained, uh, governments may have more restricted access to cloud services, primarily because of the regulatory frameworks adopted uh, in their country. So the uh, low framework, uh, as described by uh, uh, by Royal, and hence the highest costs and lowest quality of cloud computing services, would be the combination of having a government-run CSP provider uh, by itself, uh, strict prohibition of the storage and processing of government data overseas, and uh, inadequate legal frameworks for cybersecurity. Uh, and so therefore, uh, we would argue that there are three sets of policies or policy frameworks that would be most effective for stimulating the migration of government systems to the cloud, uh, which would be first an explicit cloud-first policy for government uh, combined with the competitive cloud services industry model uh, and a procurement mechanism designed for effective cloud service acquisition. Uh, two, uh, policies that allow data storage and processing beyond a country's borders, including for the majority of government data categories. And three, uh, a level of cybersecurity regulation procedures and capabilities that would be aligned with international standards. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. So clearly there's a, dis a distinction to be made between the public and the private sector in terms of how cloud adoption can be stimulated. And I think this is a, a good point to bring to uh, Natasha. Um, so drawing on, on um, what Peter was saying, it, it seems that effective cooperation between uh, governments and the private sector would be very important in terms of rolling out cloud computing at the, at the broader level. So could I ask you what your experience of this has been so far and, and what more can, can be done? And in particular, are there any differences in cloud adoption rates and impacts according to things like firm size, firm sector, and so on? Please go ahead, Natasha. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks very much. I mean, the so from a private sector uh, perspective, I mean, we're, we are really investing a lot in the development of these technologies uh, and cloud technologies. And... Um, Cloud, just to step back a little bit, is, is really a general purpose technology that enables access to a, a very vast range of ICT resources, um, everything from AI, uh, ML to database to storage, et cetera. And uh, cooperation with governments is really critical. I think as we saw in the presentation, um, the policy uh, stance of, of governments across Asia Pacific is, is really key. And we, we, we saw that in some countries where governments have adopted very proactively policies that support the use of cloud, that support a free flow of data across borders, um, that support the adoption of international security standards for cloud service provision. Um, and also one thing that wasn't mentioned, but that's very important is the um, streamlined procurement of cloud services, particularly by, by government agencies. It's really important. So we do see that in, in some countries, there's, there's a very high level of proactivity by governments such as Japan, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, for example, which have Lead, have been leading on digitalization of government, uh, among other things, uh, in implementing the, these kinds of, of policies. Uh, another area of co uh, cooperation is uh, beyond the policy enabling environment, also in the area of skills development, where there's very significant opportunities for partnerships between private sector, private technology sector and government in upskilling people both within and beyond government uh, in, in these digital technologies. Um, regarding the question about uh, firms and um, firm size, see, these, these are technologies. Cloud is, is a technology that is really being adopted across the board in Asia Pacific. I mean, you, uh, of course, digital native businesses uh, are often the first movers, and some of these are actually going all out on cloud. But um, and large enterprises uh, see themselves moving from their legacy systems to cloud-based systems. Sometimes this can take a, a, a number of months or years uh, and require significant change management. But we also see that small and medium and, uh, businesses are adopting cloud uh, very quickly, um, particularly in countries such as Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand. And in terms of the sectoral distribution, um, this uh, big area is, of course, in these digital native businesses that I mentioned, but also in the financial sector, 
in regulated industries such as healthcare, education, telecommunications. Uh, we also see it uh, at the smaller level in agriculture. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's a really important area for collaboration going forward. Thank you. Thanks very much, Natasha. Very interesting. I think you touched on a, a range of different sectors which can be important for the for the rollout of uh, cloud and, and the impacts that this could have. And this really um, links to my next question to Dil Rahut. Um, you know, we're driving towards um, increasing acceleration towards the SDGs. And I wonder if you could give some thoughts on how you think the link to the SDGs can be made to greater adoption of cloud computing and you know which areas would be important um, and which areas would be likely to benefit the most in this regard. Please go ahead, Bill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, as as uh, as uh, Rahu, uh, Peter, Natasha already highlighted that uh, cloud compu computing can bring bring about enormous benefit, particularly in terms of economic benefit. You can see how it can transform the growth. And also, Peter highlighted about the bottlenecks, how we can ease those bottlenecks and the role of Natasha came forward, how the role of uh, private uh, public sectors cooperation is essential in actually moving forward and driving about the changes. But then the one of the most important sectors, uh, one of the most important factors why cloud computing is important and can help in uh, for the society to move forward is to look at uh, look uh, cloud computing from the sustainable sustainability perspective. Uh, if you look at cloud computing, cloud computing is nothing, it's a model that enables user to access the software quickly and easily without, without having to measure, manage the fundamental uh, substructure. So so that's the key, you know, with that, with that itself actually helps in, you know, thinking through as to how cloud computing can help uh, help in achieving SDGs or sustainability. So, so with that, uh, uh, let me go forward and 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 share with you how it, how uh, how sustainable uh, uh, how cloud computing can help in uh, sustainable development. Uh, one of the things that uh, that we can see we can look at from the energy efficiency. As you know, uh, energy contributes to about uh, like uh, three quarters of the GAG emissions. Therefore, minimizing energy use can help in achieving number of sustainable development goal like. Uh, climate actions and 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 various others. So, so having cloud computing can significantly reduce energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions compared to traditional on-premise data centers. Cloud cloud provider can take advantage of economy of scale to optimize energy use and improve efficiency of the infrastructure. So clearly, we can see the, 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 that through cloud uh, through adoptions of cloud computing. We are able to achieve energy efficiency. The the second uh, important thing that we can we can achieve uh, is re uh, reduce hardware waste. As you know, that if we have to build data center at every point, you can imagine the amount of resources that's required, the amount of of GAG emissions that will have to happen to build those data centers. With the help of uh, cloud computing organizations can reduce the amount of physical hardware they need to maintain their IT infrastructure. This, this can help in minimizing e-waste, which can have a significant impact on the environment. The, the third important thing, particularly from the developing country perspective, as, as, as most of you know, I come from a small country, and I always believe that how a small country like mine can benefit from cloud computing. Cloud computing can help improve access to technology in developing countries by providing a more affordable and flexible way to access computing resources. So that's, that's something very useful and that can help drive uh, SDGs achievement even in small countries uh, who do not have access to this big uh, data centers infrastructure. And the fourth one is uh, remote work. As you know, like with COVID, there has been lots of remote work happening. Uh, cloud computing, computing can play a very important role in enabling remote work environment so this can help in uh, help reduce commuting and decrease carbon emissions uh, associated with uh, transportation, and uh, and uh, and finally, the, uh, cloud computing can enable organizations uh, uh, to adopt more sustainable business practice by facilitating collaboration, communication, reduce paper waste, and optimizing resources. So 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 there are a number of areas where cloud computing 
can actually impact uh, the sustainable development, sustainable growth, uh, and particularly uh, the the reduced uh, DHG use, uh, uh, reduced emission of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, and and we have already seen, you know, several initiatives uh, realizing the benefits of cloud computing. Several governments have actually initiated policies, like Europe has come forward with what you call the EU uh, cloud computing strategies, European cloud initiative. Indian government also has come up with uh, the national cloud initiative, the Indian smart city emissions national grid highway emissions. So there are a number of initiatives that are already moving forward. And I feel not only the economic benefits that it brings, it brings about uh, about environmental benefits and also social benefits. So so recognizing those those humongous amount of benefits that cloud computing can provide, uh, several countries are moving forward. I think the momentum has to be accelerated uh, and, and, and expedited more. Thank you, John. I pass that. Thanks very much, Dil, for these very comprehensive insights on the on the wider implications. But I think that's something that is apparent also from Rail's pre presentation is that addressing risk and enhancing trust will be important. So at this point, I would like to bring in Mayan Lim, um, who is an expert in this field, and, and ask her about um, these issues from a data governance perspective, including issues around cross-border and, and platform interoperability, for example, and how, how we can really enhance trust, reduce security risks, and improve the overall performance as a result of that. Um, so, Mayan, can, could you please uh, speak for a few minutes on that, please? No problem. I think that this is the crisis of this particular generation, isn't it, everybody? I think everybody is looking for that trust. How can we make sure that the information that the government is using, or the governments themselves asking, how can we, how can we trust that this information that we're using openly on the cloud is going to be accessible to us. And I see a, a question um, in the question and answer also asking about uh, about uh, data portability. I know if you want to change uh, providers, how are you going to be able to do it without fees? And how, how is it easy, et cetera? So I think that there are trust mechanisms in place already. And I'm quite sure that, uh, John, between yourself, Natasha, Dill, and Raul, we know, for example, um, uh, and, and Peter also, that we know that there are international standards, for example, that are critical for our understanding and everybody needs to get on board this idea of trust us or trust the, the cloud or trust the cloud provider because there are certain standards by which interoperability is enabled. An ISO standard, I, IEEE standard, look at exactly what you want to do and get that reassurance that people are following certain standards. So that's one mechanism by which trust can be and should be engendered. What's tricking, what's tripping us up is that because some uh, some governments and some uh, departments perhaps are not able to understand this and they try to reinvent the wheel and we're seeing national standards come up. Actually, we don't actually need national standards. Uh, we, we can actually rely on international standards. So that's one part of a trust. Uh, mechanism uh, using international standards. The, set, the second is actually look at uh, organizations and design your data architecture by ensuring interoperability but from the design stage. Think about it right from the start. So this is for the government architects who are possibly looking at re-engineering or re-architecting their whole entire information systems. Look at that, ask the questions, demand these questions of your provider. I'm quite sure that the private sector people are really happy to have these conversations with you. I think the more information that you can give when you start the contractual negotiations, start that trust building right from the get-go. We need this, we need this, we need this, we need this. I think where I've seen a lot of, of uh, organizations trip up is when they go to an organization, a cloud organization, and they they said, we don't really know what we want, and then they just get the stuff off the shelf. And I think that that's a, a bad, it's not, a, it's not the smartest thing to do because you want to have control of your data. You are the data owner in, in, in effect of that corporate information. You need to do it by, by design. Um, to your second point, John, about sort of the trust between organizations and trust in governments, I think that it works on a couple of levels for cross-border data flows in particular. There are government to government or uh, agreements there are business to business agreements there is also business to government agreements that need to be set up and i think that these work on three different levels because you need in the first instance if you want 
data to flow between one country to the other country. Sure, you can be a private sector, but the private sector still needs to be, is beholden to the government. So you kind of need to make sure that the, 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 the organization um, jurisdiction that you're in is going to be sensible in the first instance. You actually have to be cognizant of this. There are countries which are uh, very open uh, in, in terms of cross-border data flows, and you can see that model contractual clauses, they, the government actually works within the business-to-business the -business arrangement to enable that cross-border data flows. But there are some governments who are, it, it, it is a fragmented landscape. There are some governments who are sort of tripped up a little bit by that. And that is actually right now being complicated by um, the fallout of big tech, the tech clash that we're seeing right now. A lot of governments are sort of like, oh, you know, we need data localization because of, we need, again, coming back to the first point that you brought up, John, we need more trust. In the system, we need more we need more more uh, accountability mechanisms to let us trust this whole entire system of cloud computing before we can uh, trust that we can be moving on to this whole entire system. Especially since now government budgets are increasing uh, because more and more people are realizing that digitalization is a, a key important part of modernizing the public sector. I'm going to stop there. Uh, pass it back to you, John. Thanks very much, Mayan. Uh, very practical uh, solutions there, particularly on being transparent um, between uh, government and private sector. This is clearly very important. However, I think there are obvious challenges related to the, the natural uh, cross-border elements of, of cloud and, and essentially anything digital in nature. Um, but before I move to the second round, which will be the q and I would like to ask Raul a question um, which is somewhat more forward-looking and, and follows on from uh, the discussion with Mayan. Um, so, Rule, what's your view on how cloud adoption um, is likely to evolve going forward? Looking at issues around, for example, advancement in artificial intelligence and these types of, of issues. Yeah, well, uh, this is um, the area of research that we're engaged right now because, in fact, um, the, the field known as generative AI, which is the latest generation of AI technology, is something quite recent. In fact, uh, ChatGPT and others were pretty much launched in 2022 and uh, later on. And But what we are seeing is, in fact, uh, there's a saying in the industry that says there's no such a thing as AI without cloud computing. And there's no cloud computing without AI. Basically, what we see is a complementarity of both technologies that is driven by the intrinsic economics of AI. Um, in, in the vernacular, uh, an AI system needs to be trained, and let's call it um, de uh, develop. Develop in order to be able to provide the services required for users. Well, to train uh, an AI model, uh, take for instance, ChatGPT, ChatGPT is composed of eight models with 220 billion parameters per model, which in, as a total is 1.76 trillion parameters that need to be trained in order to provide the services that we tend to uh, you know, benefit of when we are using Claude or, or ChatGPT or, or other platforms. Now that training, that development, cannot be achieved in small data centers. The only way by which you can actually proceed in training the, these platforms is through the huge data centers that are operated by uh, some of the large cloud service providers. So from a development standpoint, the future development of AI is intrinsically related to cloud computing. But the, the, the dependency or the complementarity between both technologies doesn't end there. Because once those systems are trained, those platforms are trained, then you have millions and millions of users that, relying on the, that rely on them in order to get the value that we obtain by uh, depending, interrogating those platforms. Then from a demand standpoint, cloud computing is, 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 is essential for the delivery of AI services. What we've seen is in fact, purely from a um, revenue standpoint, from a spending standpoint, ever since 2022, we've seen a jump in the spending of cloud computing that is directly related to the usage of AI. So what we are developing right now are models that integrate both technologies 
and assess their complementarity as value of delivering the spillover. This is the future that we are looking right now. This is where we're starting to see in the development of the cloud industry. Thank you, John. Thanks very much, Raul. So I think you've laid out very clearly the interrelationship between AI and cloud computing, and this perhaps makes the challenges even more stark given that we are already uncertain about the future of AI, um, and this will naturally spill over to cloud computing, creating potentially more challenges for policymakers to enhance issues around security and trust. Um, so I think um, we, we still have a lot of work uh, to do in that regard. Um, I would now like to turn to the Q&A round. I can see that there are already uh, some questions in the Q&A box. Um, I think I will select uh, a few of these questions. We have around 15, 20 minutes left. Um, so the, a question I see here is specific to the case of the Philippines. Um, and if there are specific barriers that uh, prevent the Philippines from advancing in terms of cloud adoption, uh, cloud computing uh, up to the level, for example, achieved uh, by Singapore and Malaysia. This was sort of touched on uh, you know, in the discussions that we had so far, but would anyone like to expand a little bit on, on the case of the Philippines? Natasha, please go ahead, thank you. Uh, maybe just, just a few comments. Uh, actually, the Philippines was one of, uh, Philippines has um, cloud adoption across various sectors of the economy. And it was one of the first uh, countries in Southeast Asia to adopt the cloud first policy for government in 2017. Uh, so that's actually a very positive step. Um, in addition, the you know, Philippines has um, um, laws that permit cross-border flow of data. So the, the key factor here, uh, especially for, on the government side, is how can government agencies actually procure cloud service more uh, efficiently and effectively? So, uh, and this, this is a challenge that's faced in the Philippines, but also in other developing economies, where there is a real need to look at what is a kind of whole of government, a holistic government approach to sourcing cloud services, procuring cloud services, accepting the fact that uh, cloud providers have international accreditations and certifications. So I think uh, the uptake of, of cloud services in government is, uh, is very important in the Philippines. Another area that uh, is important is also the enabling infrastructure, which in the case of the Philippines is the need for more widespread access to affordable high-speed internet. Um, so I think those are, those are some factors to consider. Thank you. Thanks, Natasha. Uh, I can see another question here about uh, potential non-linearity in the in the effects. So, a, de a decrease in, in cloud penetration on on growth could have uh, some different effects um, and some different types of spillovers. Um, do you have any view on that? For example, Raúl. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very important question. A very important question because. Uh, when we started studying this, we were looking at some countries, take Singapore in particular, that have extremely high levels of cloud adoption. Well, what happens is, in fact, that um, when you have high levels of cloud adoption, what you need to look at is what are they using cloud services for? Because if you look at the range, and, and the OECD is very good at tracking these down, the range of applications that you can rely on cloud uh, go from very basic applications such as email being provided by a cloud pro, um, service uh, company to uh, CRM, customer relationship management, ERPs, uh, which is the, 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 the uh, industrial productivity platforms, so on and so forth, even in terms of AI. So you might have uh, a declining growth in penetration for countries that are <clears throat> reaching the 100% the, the of adoption among enterprises. But what, what is increasing is the level of sophistication in the platforms that they are adopting uh, by relying on cloud computing. And for instance, obviously getting into AI and, and, and so the plat uh, more platforms. So from a decreasing uh, growth rate in penetration, it's compensated by an increasing level of sophistication in the kind of applications that you're using and consequently, a very high uh, economic effect. 
So it's not a situation where you're saying, well, I'm reaching saturation point and therefore my, my economic benefits are going to decline purely because I have a hundred of enterprises rely on cloud. What you need to monitor and uh, analyze is what are companies and governments using cloud uh, for? Obviously that poses an issue in terms of data availability and, and, and thank you, uh, some uh, statistical units, the OECD and Eurostat are very good at tracking the usage of cloud, and therefore you can monitor how countries are moving uh, down the path of sophistication, and therefore try to measure the, the the economic impact of moving down that particular path. Okay, thanks very much, Real. Very interesting. So basically, what you're saying is that a reduction in penetration is not necessarily uh, negative on growth. It depends on other factors, uh, such as you know. How productive, for example, the use of that cloud adoption would be. Um, I would like to. I see another question here that I think is perhaps um, appropriate for for Mayan. So, when governments decide to switch cloud providers, what can they do to mitigate the prohibitive costs of uh, data transfer fees? I love that question. It's very, very uh, practical and pragmatic. I think that the first assumption is that there are prohibitive costs involved. Um, I think that the the fear is always around the, the question of vendor lock-in and how how uh, connected you are to that particular uh, cloud provider. I don't actually think that the costs are prohibitive, so I would like to challenge that assumption in that question in the first instance. Um, in the second instance, I believe that, again, coming back to my point that I made earlier, you wouldn't buy a car without understanding you know, what exactly you're, you're getting into. If you buy an electric car, you need to understand that, well, do you have an electric, uh, a place to park it, et cetera. So if you're wanting to go on to cloud, you need to understand that there will be some switching costs in inverted commas, but have you designed and, your, and, ar and architected your, your information system to the point where it is actually rolling over perhaps into some other system where you can have a backup, which you don't need in inverted commas, that prohibitive cost of egress. Uh, so I, I personally would challenge a couple of things there. Did you did you even think about it before you? I, I don't I don't quite understand the question because it does sound like um, it might be a situation where the procurement was done uh, perhaps not perhaps too quickly, and you've gotten yourself stuck into a situation where uh, there are prohibitive costs. In which case you might need to indeed uh, talk to the vendor and say, hey, this is this is a little bit unreasonable. We need to find a way to mitigate against this, uh, which is a contractual thing. And I think that that's something which which you and the IT department and the procurement department have a discussion around. Uh, but in, from my understanding, I think that I would challenge the first assumption that there are going to be prohibitive costs. Thanks very much, Mayan. You have... Uh broken down that question into a very practical solution. So thanks thanks for that. Um, I see another question here that uh, seems to be suitable for Dill. Um, so this is on the, the potential social costs of cloud computing. Um, do you have any view of uh, what those might be? Uh, thank you, John. I, I think this is a very important question that we need to reflect. Uh, uh, like we have been always talking about how uh, how uh, cloud computing or digitalization can bring in benefit. Yes, all the technology brings in benefit, but there are also challenges that we really need to carefully look into it and see how we mitigate those challenges. Unless we acknowledge those challenges, we cannot frame a policy that is inclusive and that is, uh, that is more sustainable. So that's something that uh, I think we should keep in mind. So if you look at uh, like cloud computing, it, it's a technology that uses uh, clouds and 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 uh, and if 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 you if you look at what's happening today, there's already a digital divide. So cloud computing can also lead to that wider gap. So it's very important to make sure that how everyone can access it. That's one point that I'd like to make. But then, that with together with that, it also brings in about several challenges. Like for example, uh, as Rahul and and Natasha and, and and everyone has highlighted that data privacy and security also, I think it's a social cost. So as data uh, cloud provider moves towards more sustainable practice, 
so 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 data privacy and security is, is is a very important issue that that we really need to look into uh, together with this uh, thing environmental risk uh, which is also uh, can be associated with social risk well uh, renewable energy sources are generally seen as more environmentally friendly but they can also pose uh, environmental risk right uh, because uh, like for example hydroelectric power that they use uh, for for uh, for for to the data centers cloud computing data centers can have impact on other biodiversity biodiversity resources so so those things also need to be looked at and the the problem of greenwashing also comes into picture uh, so so that's why we, uh, as natasha highlighted the certification the green certification is is very very important and and resource depletion issues also needs to be taken into account and and the impact on the local economy also is something that we really need, need to look at so so together with this there are a large number of other social environmental costs that may arise uh, which we really need to look at it carefully to see how we minimize those uh, impacts thanks john Thank you very much, still very interesting. Um, I, I see that we have a couple of questions left in the in the Q and A box, and I would like to ask uh, Peter Morgan one of these questions. Um, so one is on the issue of again related to trust. Um, in respect of hyperscalers, uh, in the case of the US. Um, so the question is posed that you know most hyperscalers are US based, so. Why should governments trust their their national data with these uh, hyperscalers? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I think it, it it ultimately will depend on the reputation of those hyperscalers, uh, and obviously they have a uh, an incentive to uh, to uh, make sure that uh, that that trust which is being uh, placed in in them it it is not violated, so that uh, uh, there is a uh, I think to some extent a and a, a market enforcement mechanism. But uh, on the other hand, um, we, we know from experience that we cannot always rely on, on markets to be self-enforcing. So that does call for uh, some kind of uh, regulatory oversight. Now, now, how that can be handled on an international basis is, is something that would have to, to, to be worked out. But uh, uh, I think ultimately, uh, if we do see abuses, that uh, that that will uh, uh, tend to call forth a regulatory re response of uh, some kind. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Raul has a hand raised. Go ahead, Raul. Uh, yeah, just I, I wanted to bring um, as as I stand, I, I'm in a, right now in a country in the Caribbean, looking at the use of technology in education, and in in my dialogue with policymakers. Uh, they have an issue where they, they don't have the systems to be able to monitor the performance of students, both at the primary and secondary level, uh, and, and, and how they are advancing in terms of their learning and their attendance to classes and the like. And the, the ability to rely on a hyperscaler to uh, develop the systems would allow them to uh, develop the, the, the functionality required at a very rapid pace and fulfill a social need along the lines of what uh, Dill was mentioning, that is critical. So uh, I would think that uh, go, um, uh, in parallel with looking at the um, regulatory issues that uh, Peter was mentioning, you have to look at what am I gonna use cloud in terms of the benefits that it's going to be deriving. And, and, and in asking um, the government officials, uh, do you have any concern about relying on a hyperscaler that is located beyond your borders relative to the opportunity of delivering value in terms of the use of technology for educational purposes? And they say, listen, after the problems that we had on the pandemic, there's no doubt about it. We actually do need that. So I think that we have to look at it in terms of what am I going to de derive out of this? Is there any risk relative to the regulatory standpoint? And from that perspective, you reach conclusions that, that, that this is critical for the needs of many countries that today cannot benefit from the uh, technology required to deliver their social goods. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Nayan, please go ahead. 
Hi, thank you, uh, Obi, for that question. I really, really like it. And speaking as an Asian, dealing a lot with the fragmentation and the request, the constant request for data localization, I feel and I understand where that's coming from. I'm going to, I'm going to say something super controversial <laughs> and just answer that question there. I'll, I'll say this. You should be asking the question, why should governments trust their national data with hyperscalers? And the answer, especially from a national security perspective, is that you probably will not want to have your data in a jurisdiction outside of you. However, you need to understand what Raul just mentioned, which is, are you in a position to choose that option right now? Do you have the ability to store your data, to store your national data, to store your military data, whatever data that you have and consider your countries, your sovereign data, do you have the ability better than the hyperscalers to protect that data? You got to look at yourself very, very honestly and ask yourself, do you have the ability? There are many countries right now who are facing um, uh, seismic activity. And if you can't protect your data centers from an earthquake, that is a really big question. I think that you want to make sure that from your own risk assessment perspective, make your own risk assessments. Are you in a better position to control, to manage, to protect the data that you want stored for your country? I'll give you one last example. I was watching an interview um, a couple of years ago with the Estonian CTO, the, the government um, chief technology officer. And he said, we will always store our information for Estonia, government information outside of Estonia, because if Estonia ever falls, we will be able to rise again from the ashes. I thought that that was, wow, that was a complete, uh, a fantastic statement of uh, an endorsement of cloud computing if I ever saw one. So in terms of risk management, I say, do your own risk management uh, and make that assessment by yourself. I'm not saying yes or no, but do your own risk assessment. I hope that makes sense to, to Yeah, that to makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. I, I see we have one final question, um, which is on, if I understand correctly, um, how the cloud could actually be used at, at the local level. Um, so are, are there ways that this could be measured uh, effectively? Perhaps we could return that to Raul. Uh, if, you could respond within a minute, and then I will wrap up the webinar. Cloud is used as uh, at the local level. In fact, it, there is a, a, a non-dependency between where is the processing facility located relative to where they're using uh, that data for or that processing facility for. So from my perspective, there is no such a thing as a, a opposite ends because I don't have the facilities in country, I'm not going to. I'm not going to benefit from it. From I, I think that from a logical standpoint, uh, d data is locally based. How where do I process? How do I store it? Uh, that's totally independent. And the issue is, well, I'm going what uh, what Mayan was saying. I mean, uh, in theory, uh, um, you you do your risk assessment, but don't think about this. Uh, from a dependency from where, where the data is. In fact, I would argue that in many cases, as the Estonian case exemplifies, is storing it overseas might provide you a higher level of security, primarily not only because physical and you're not located within the country, but also because the uh, security facilities of, 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 of um, hyperscalers are, are quite developed and much more developed than what a local uh, cloud service provider might my, my uh, offer or even uh, an on-premise data center. Okay, thank Raul, thank you very much. Um, we have come to the end of this uh, webinar. I think we have learned a lot. First of all, economic impacts are significant um, given a favorable policy environment, but I think there are key risks as we have discussed. The path will be different for different economies. There are risks that go beyond national borders, which also need to be considered as well. Um, there are other uncertainties related to AI, which also need to be taken into account somehow as economies would seek to evolve uh, in terms of cloud adoption and reaping the economic benefits associated with that, as, as well as progress towards the SDGs. However, we have uh, run out of time. I would like to thank all of the panelists um, for a very interesting uh, discussion today and, and deepening our insights on this important issue. 
Um, before we close today's webinar, I would like to invite all uh, participants and anyone listening to this uh, webinar to the next uh, Asian Impact webinar, which will be on decarbonizing uh, global value chains. And that will take place on the 7th of March, 2024, at 9 to 10 a.m. Manila time via Zoom. Um, please keep an eye on the Asian Impact webinar webpage and the Chief Economist X account for more updates on, on the Asian Impact webinar and, and other uh, ADB related activities. Um, with that, I will close. And once again, thank you very much and see you again. Bye bye.